Okay, this week we're going to look at a uh, category of the life stages that our author calls toddlerhood and early childhood. And so this is, again, split up into two parts just to kind of make this a little bit more easy, that easily digestible. I hope you all are still staying tuned into the channel, channel Bill and uh, uh, are, are getting some things from these lectures. So uh, anyway, we'll proceed here. The toddler uh, stage, is, as uh, we've talked about earlier, really varies a little bit from theorist to theorist or perspective to perspective. But generally speaking, and for the purposes of this text, uh, any young child between the ages of 12 to 36 months, 1 to 3 years of age, is considered a toddler. And during this phase of, of life, the uh, child will turn his attention or her attention more and more to the external environment. So it really begins with a focus upon family relationships and things, but eventually uh, ends up in, engaged with adults and children outside the family system as well. And uh, in, law, uh, in line with what we talked about some weeks back about the developmental niches that children grow up in, early childhood and toddlerhood looks very different uh, from place to place depending upon one socioeconomic class, uh, race, gender, uh, geographical location, and, and also time and history. So we're talking here again largely about you know middle class children and white middle class children when we talk about the typical child because that's what most of our our studies cover but there's a lot of uh, a lot of areas left for study and and uh, research in in this um, in this and other areas of life so first just a little bit about physical development uh, during this period of time from one to three years of age the the uh, toddler uh, nearly doubles uh, his or her birth height and by age two will have quadrupled uh, the original weight that the child was born with. So that's quite a lot of growth during this time physically speaking. And yet um, one quarter of the children younger than five years of age uh, around the world are stunted in growth due to malnutrition. Interesting here that malnutrition is actually described in two different ways, one of which is the one we're more familiar with and we tend to think about, which is undernutrition caused by inadequate intake of nutrients. But this text also talks about another form of malnutrition, which is obesity. And I guess we, when we, because we think of uh, undernutrition, when we think of malnutrition, obesity seems like it's almost counterintuitive. But when you look at the term malnutrition, that's bad nutrition, it makes perfect sense. So obesity caused by excessive intake of foods high in calories is another form of malnutrition. And one that uh, while, while um, our lower socioeconomic uh, groups in the United States certainly suffer from undernutrition in many respects. Both that group and and uh, children in in the higher socioeconomic groups in the United States certainly um, are struggling with issues about obesity, unlike ever before. The brain continues to be shaped by experience throughout toddlerhood, early childhood, and beyond, and it it uh, continues at a very rapid pace, but it has slowed down some. That uh, synaptogenesis that it, we talked about uh, last week, I mean, slowed down some in infancy, but but nonetheless, uh, by this time, there there has been enough of that synaptogenesis that it has resulted in an overabundance of synapses in the brain and uh, a tripling in the brain weight during the first three years. Uh, again, something that... Uh, I don't know, is new information to me, and I believe it's probably new information out there, relatively speaking, is the, uh, we talk about the period of overproduction of synapses is referred to as blooming, but also there's a period of pruning or a reduction of the synapses that occurs um, as the, as the brain development goes on too fast and too, too uh, robustly, I guess, um, so that the synapses that exist in a brain improve the efficiency of brain functioning. It's a very interesting concept, and I can think of all sorts of little uh, nasty comebacks I can come up with about blooming and pruning for people when they say things I, I don't agree with, but we'll, we'll, we'll move on with that. 
There's also another process that's referred to by the experts in brain development called lateralization. And this is where the two hemispheres of the brain begin to operate somewhat differently from each other. And this allows for a wider range of activity. The left hemisphere devoting itself mostly to tasks that require analytical skills, uh, speaking and reading and and those kinds of things, whereas the right hemisphere uh, relates to tasks that involve more emotional expression, expression and spatial skills and visual imagery. Now, what's interesting about this to me, when we talk about left and right hemisphere functions of the brain, you know, of course, the right hemisphere uh, below the, the brain or below the neck controls the left side of the body, and the left hemisphere controls the right side of the body. Left-handed people, um, I think, statistically speaking tend to be the more the more artistic and creative uh, individuals their personalities tend more towards emotional expression and expression of of the things inside whereas um, left hemisphere people those are right-handed people tend to be more associated with logic and and you know cognitions and things like that so this this really kind of lines up with that quite a bit there's a uh, a good chart in uh, its exhibit 12.1 in the text that uh, displays the typical development of gross and fine motor skills for children in this age range and it really kind of breaks it down year by year pretty much in terms of development and and if you're interested in in how uh, a typical child develops there's a good there's a good reference for you again you know this term typical as opposed to normal I think is is a much better term and I, I like the fact that the author uses that term because what is normal um, you know really is well isn't just one little thing it, it can be a wide range of things and so typical kind of implies more the 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 average person I guess now, when we go into uh, areas of cognitive and language development, one of the first um, areas or theorists that we're going to look at are Piaget's stages. And, and you remember we we uh, looked at the first four substages of the sensory motor, I'm sorry, the sensory motor stage uh, in the last chapter, you know, in terms of infancy. In, 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 to in toddlerhood and early childhood, well, in toddlerhood, substage five and substage six, six <laughs> of the sensory motor stage. It's a lot of alliteration in that sentence. Um, those substages five and six really kind of focus in the first two years of, of, um, of life so that, uh, and you can see the different kinds of ways that uh, the infant brain uh, begins to develop in terms of cognitive abilities. The second stage in Piaget's theory, the pre-operational stage, um, begins to get a footing somewhere around the ages of two to three. Um, and again, this is the typical child. Some children progress more slowly, some children progress more rapidly, and it's all normal. <laughs> but uh, the substage one and substage two in the pre-operational stages where uh, the, uh, the young child is beginning to develop uh, the ability to uh, represent things symbolically. And this includes, because words are symbols, this includes also the development of language. And also... Um, well, there it is, language to represent objects in substage two. Uh, transductive reasoning and egocentrism all begin to develop during this period of time where everything is kind of interpreted through egocentrism, through the uh, infant's own mind and how it relates to that, to that particular child. By 18 to 24 months, the toddler has learned uh, about one word each week, one new word every week. Um, around the age of two, typical toddlers have a vocabulary of 50 to 100 words. Uh, they're able to follow directions and put two or three words together. By the end of toddlerhood, which I think, again, is three years of age on average, we have a vocabulary of about a thousand words. So you can see how rapidly language develops, vocabulary develops uh, in that third year of life. And by the fourth year of life, it's so remarkably sophisticated that the toddler is usually speaking in sentences of eight to 10 words. But it is a gradual process as, as again, the typical, the typical progression here. Moral development, we're gonna spend a number of slides on, on this and uh, 
for different reasons. There's just a lot to cover here, and maybe because it's a little more abstract. Um, but uh, the the three components of moral development that the text identifies uh, during early childhood includes knowledge of the moral code of the community and how to use that knowledge to make moral judgments, emotions that produce the capacity to care about others, and the capacity to feel guilt and remorse. And this sounds a little bit like the early stages of empathy and actions to inhibit negative impulses as well as to behave in a pro-social or helpful and empathic manner. Now there are different theoretical approaches that are discussed, I think three different ones here in the text and the psychodynamic approach being the first one. And we know Freud talked about the superego that was essentially the the, um, the parent in, in Eric Burns' model of the parent adult child. And in the superego, is the guidance for moral development. And Freud identified two aspects of the superego, which first is the basis of a moral code, which is called the conscience. And then the ego, ego ideal, which is a set of expectations for the moral individual to emulate. So we have a conscience, I think, that tells us when we've committed right and wrong. And that conscience in part, uh, I think, compares ourselves, our self-perception and our recognition of our behaviors against the ego ideal, how we how we ought to be behaving in our minds. So Freud Freud thought that superego was formed somewhere around uh, the ages of four to seven, you know, as early uh, late childhood, early early elementary age. But more and more research now seems to to be suggesting that uh, moral development begins in infancy. That's uh, I'd be interested in in finding out how they go about testing that out with so. Children so very young, but uh, this is what this is what at least our authority here is telling us. Um, moral behavior, moral development, all encouraged by such things as warmth by the parent, uh, the capacity to engage the child in democratic decision making. Uh, even even in early childhood, parents can engage a child in some sort of democracy in terms of determining things modeling, temptation resistance, close affectional bond with the caregiver, all these kinds of things help the child develop a, a moral behavior and, and uh, a sense of morality. The social learning approach uh, looks at reinforcers and punishers and in the environment and, and basically believes that the moral behavior of the child is shaped by those things. Children will repeat behaviors that are rewarded and, uh, and are going to become very anxious and maybe avoid behaviors that result in negative consequences. In order for this to be effective, and this is where sometimes parents have some difficulty, is consistency is important. And, and uh, because if, if there are sometimes behaviors that aren't reinforced, it should be, especially when the child is first learning those behaviors, it can become very confusing. And, and so, um, so anyway, consistency is very helpful in, in this process. And also, uh, children learn uh, how to conduct themselves also by observing their models. And this is, again, something we have touched on previously. The, uh, by, by the way, one, again, one theorist, at least, is associated with social learning, and there are many of them, but one that always comes to mind for me is Albert Bandura. Um, the cognitive developmental approach indicates that children's moral judgments change as their cognitive abilities develop. In other words, as they're able to think things through better, then their their moral judgments are going to improve. And every time a child is in a new situation or is exposed to different perspectives on an event, they have an opportunity to, you know, to develop their moral judgments more robustly, I suppose. And one of the big theorists is uh, Lawrence Kohlberg. He is, uh, his, his theory has three levels of moral development and we're only looking at one of them here, which is the pre-conventional level uh, in early childhood. Children reason at the pre-conventional level, and that's divided into two stages. First, the uh, reasoning based on what gets rewarded or punished. So, you know, it's that, that kind of like what social learning says, you know, children repeat what gets rewarded and, and avoid things that will result in punishment. And stage two, um, 
there, there's a bit of a reach outside of the of the individual there because the moral reasoning is based on what benefits the child or, or significant others, what, what benefits accrue to the child for, for certain decisions and behaviors. It's a little different from, from just responding to rewards and punishments. Now, all three of those approaches, the psychodynamic, social learning, and, um, and uh, cognitive developmental approach, all um, have been criticized because there are two key elements uh, in moral development that, that aren't mentioned, which is empathy and perspective taking. There has been some research among neuroscience recently suggesting that there's a specific kind of brain cell that are called mirror neurons that are key to the development of, of the capacity for empathy. Uh, these these uh, neurons allow us to sense the move that another person is about to make and the emotions that he or she is experiencing. And as, as the text says, you know, emotion is contagious because mirror neurons allow us to feel what the other person feels through a sort of brain to brain connection. That's a, it's an interesting concept. And having worked with, um, well, adolescent sex offenders in, in the mental health center, but also with adolescent sex offenders more specifically, one of the hallmarks of, of those offenders as well as other offenders for that matter is a, a lack of empathy for the victim. Empathy, if they experienced empathy um, and they had the capacity for perspective taking, let's say, uh, they, they would likely put themselves in their victim's shoes and not be able to follow through with whatever behavior they're rationalizing. Now that's oversimplifying things, I will tell you, but, but nonetheless, we know that empathy doesn't, is, is very deficient in offenders. And so one of the things you do in treatment of offenders, uh, I, I like doing this some with the younger, younger kids, just take them out somewhere, maybe to a, a mall or, you know, some, in some public setting in a restaurant or whatever, and, and uh, have, you know, have them uh, kind of look at, observe some other people and maybe identify one or two people and, and ask the child to, to get a sense of or the person to get a sense of what is it that do you think that person is feeling right now judging by body posture by by the way they're you know they're making eye contact with others you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's really an interesting experience you know to to see um, the offender begin to develop the capacity to put themselves in another person's shoes and imagine things and that's something that's very critical in treatment for those offenders Again, a little off track here, and and certainly uh, not uh, not much engaged in early childhood, but but anyway, these mirror neurons apparently are something that are pretty uh, pretty critical for for the ability to to experience empathy. And social intelligence is something really quite similar to that. It's the ability to be attuned to another person. Um, and for instance, you know, people with autism have a dysfunctional motor neuron system, they believe, and at least some of the studies are showing that. So there's another group of people that, that uh, if you're working with that population, this issue of mirror, mirror neurons may come up. Now, it's not to say that, um, um, for instance, that offenders, their behavior isn't only because they have deficient mirror neurons. So don't don't misunderstand me. There, there are many other social factors as well that are that are involved in that behavior. Empathy begins in infancy and grows throughout early childhood. And perspective and empathy is if empathy is the feeling part of relating to another person, um, different from sympathy, as I'm sure you know was covered in you know, one of your early social work courses. Um, but empathy is, is, is sort of, you know, the experience of being able to feel what another person is feeling. Perspective taking is the cognitive or the thinking activities associated with empathy. The ability to, to imagine yourself in the other person's shoes and to try to see the world as that other person sees the world. And this, th this is another activity or another, another capacity that, that grows in early childhood. Um, and, and research has shown that children with empathy and perspective taking at four and five years of age, the kids that are able to do that, are more likely to show pro-social behavior and sympathy during adolescence and early adulthood. Another theorist about moral development is Carol Gilligan, who believes that uh, Kohlberg's theory is really biased, uh, gen has a gender bias to it. And I believe uh, the text points out that most of, if not all, of Kohlberg's um, test subjects in developing his theory were 
were white males and so and middle class males at least and so uh, so uh, Gilligan believes that that it overlooks the the critical part that gender plays in how one experiences and acts on themes of, of uh, morality and so uh, she believes for instance her theory is that women's moral thought is guided more by caring for others for for uh, responding to what others needs whereas men's moral thoughts are more guided by kind of a more abstract sense of justice now i wonder you know when it, when in as as we continue to develop the notion of of gender equality and all of this how much of this is something that is socialized and i guess that's the question you know what is socialized and what might be biological i i would guess that a lot of the differences between men and women in terms of moral thinking has to do with socialization but uh you know that's uh that's for further research it's certainly from uh culture to culture moral thinking moral ideals differ uh, between especially between individualistic and collectivist cultures and there's discussion in this text as well as in others that I've read about uh, Buddhist adolescents and how they're they're uh, much more interested in in I think justice as uh, the ultimate uh, um, moral state or whatever whereas you know American uh, uh, American adolescents have different different ways of judging morality so parents can do things to help kids develop and control their behavior and uh, helping them see how their behavior affects others, um, showing them models of positive behaviors and getting them to discuss moral issues. And that's what I was going to say. This, you know, you can really see here, this, this really requires an active and engaged parent interacting with that child, not, not just disciplining the child when the child crosses the line and doesn't act uh, with the proper moral framework, let's say, but, but really uh, engages with the child and talks about these issues and helps them see the, you know, how to go about doing positive things and, and how, how good and bad behaviors have an impact on others. The uh, authors remind us that children are different though, and so not all kids, uh, Re respond to the type of correction that might be in, in or involved in this kind of dis uh, parenting. Not all of them respond the same way. So kids that are much more sensitive to disapproval, um, you know, may really need only a small dose of criticism. And in fact, too much criticism might actually kind of hurt hurt the process. But less less sensitive children, and I think we all know one or two of them may require what the author calls a, a more focused and directive discipline. I, I, I kind of like that, those, that wording. Religion comes into the discussion here as well, and I think it's um, pretty well known to, uh, to all of you in, in this class that, you know, religion that has an emphasis upon more positive uh, acceptance such as love, concern, social justice, involvement in that kind of religion is only going to aid the child's moral development. Whereas engagement in a religion that is harsh and judgmental uh, may have a tendency to uh, result in positive behaviors, but behaviors that are motivated by guilt and, and shame and worthlessness which really doesn't develop moral reasoning capacity whatsoever. It's a little like um, when we talk about parenting, that a parent who relies upon harsh physical discipline will, will command um, the um, compliance and compliant behaviors from their child. But when that parent has turned their back, that child really hasn't internalized um, that they're they're really behaving because they they're worried about punishment and 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 this is sort of the same concept I think that there's not a, a not an encouragement of a process of internalization so much at least internalization of positive ideals. Now we move on to personality and emotional development for the final few slides in this part of the the presentation for this week. Um, and we look to Erickson for this, and uh, we begin with stage two in ages one and a half to three years of age, autonomy versus shame and doubt. 
autonomy being described as a growing sense of self-awareness and a striving for independence and ability. In, in other words, understanding that uh, I am an, an individual and I can do things on my own. Shame and doubt um, really kind of clouds the capacity to to do the exploring, let's say, you know, it's associated with the terrible twos, right? And so uh, the exploring that may be necessary to act on that sense of autonomy and to have it reinforced and shame and doubt may cause uh, that to be crippled by fear of loss of love and over uh, an excessive amount of concern for approval from parents. So what parents can do here in this stage is to put firm limits for controlling impulses and managing anxieties, but at the same time giving the child the freedom to explore the environment within safe limits and acceptable limits. And this is how um, um, autonomy is developed. This is a mixture of, of um, structure and nurturance, kindness and firmness. We're going to talk about this in another few slides, but um, just Remember this, uh, that uh, structure and nurturance, two elements that are very important for a child to, to uh, flourish in terms of uh, personality and emotional development. Potty training is another issue aside from the terrible twos. And you know, the, it, it's interesting how the age at which potty training is now achieved has uh, has uh, changed over the years in American culture to where now it's occurring around, I guess, three years of age in the typical child. Earlier it was, well, it was much earlier than that. And so um, the, the current thinking is that parents should accept children's bodily functions as normal and good and praise and encourage that child uh, to, to enhance the child's mastery of self-control. Don't look at punishment, look at, look at praise and, and encouragement. And that, well, we're going to talk about the difference between punishment and discipline in a few moments, I think. Um, we move into the uh, stage three in Erickson's theories of psychosocial development as we get into early childhood. And this is the stage of initiative versus guilt. And here, this is an age when the child is reaching outside the family system now also and beginning to establish relationships with, with others, not just the parents. Uh, and during this period of time, a child's focus is upon completing tasks and feeling satisfied for having done so. Um, play is a big uh, imaginative play is a big uh, has a play uh, <laughs> plays a big role in this particular stage as well. And uh, learning to share and and both share and compete with peers through through their play with each other. You know how to get along with others and. Um, um, and so that that's uh, peer relationships begin to become very important at this stage. And that's a positive uh, take on initiative versus guilt. Of course, if if um, the child isn't able to achieve that for whatever reason, um, that he, he or she may be plagued, plagued with guilt about goals and fantasies and be too anxious and self-centered to really try to, you know, to uh, to uh, move through this stage. Remember, Erickson's theories uh, hold that, you know, one must achieve the the um, the task at each stage before they move on to the next stage. Uh, I, and again, I think we we read that there there have been some some question as to whether or not that is necessarily true, but that's still generally the basis of Erickson's theory. As mentioned earlier, the child is moving outside of the family system now for for uh, friendships outside the family by the end of this time. Um, and so they really need an opportunity to interact with peers so that they can develop peer relationships. And this is where daycare uh, might come in or play dates or um, preschool and, and playground activities, those kinds of things come in. One thing that has a notable uh, increase during this early childhood years is aggression. And, and the text talks about different types of aggression and you know, they're, they're described here. I, I don't uh, really feel the need to go into them much, but uh, all types of these aggressions can, can turn up. Interestingly, that, and, and I suppose to a certain extent, that at least the boys tend to use physical aggression more than girls. I, I, um, I don't know, I think that's a, a fairly given thing. Girls tend to make use of relational aggression more. This, uh, um, not, not using physical force, but damaging their relationships through behaviors or 
or actions. You know, I, I think about my middle son. He's got three kids and his two oldest are girls and his youngest boy who is now five years of age uh, is a boy. And um, he told me one time on the phone about the remarkable difference uh, in the experience of raising a boy versus raising girls. He said that his um, son tends to be much more physical, um, somewhat aggressive, um, hits his sisters a lot. His sisters didn't really get into hitting with each other at all, but, but, but his little boy hits his sisters and is just kind of pushing his way into everything all of the time. Go, 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 go. And, and um, it, you know, in, in a sense, I think he's finding raising this boy more difficult than raising his daughters. Um, he may, oh, now, as I step back and think about this, you know, he may feel uh, more engaged with his son because he's a boy. I think, you know, it's possible that fathers sometimes might, I'm not saying he, they disengage with raising their daughters, but maybe, you know, kind of figure that the, the, the children, that the girl's mother is going to do the primary parenting, you know, as the role model and things like that. I don't know. I may be wrong about that, but I, I, I suspect he may be a little more engaged in raising, raising this boy directly uh, more frequently, perhaps, than he had been with his daughters. I'm just guessing. The question comes to my mind, how much of that is social <laughs> and how much of it is biological and he of course sees it as a biological difference and there are arguments to that effect um, there are also arguments opposed to that as well so it's just it's just an interesting kind of thing though but studies do show that boys tend to use physical aggression more but but nonetheless somewhere during these these early years physical aggression the use of physical physical aggression will usually peak and i think you see this in in concurrence with the increase in their cognitive skills and their moral development so that uh, you know they begin to see how the impact of aggression um, you know affects others one other issue that's mentioned in this section is attachment and Attachment is still very important for feelings of security for this little child. They mention a transitional object, and we all know about transitional objects from watching Peanuts cartoons. Uh, uh, Linus and his blanket is a great example of that. This is a symbol of the relationship with the caregiver and helps them to cope with separation from the caregiver, caregiver and to deal with stressful situations. I, one of the earliest things I remember in my first job in a protective services unit in, uh, in Central Florida was my supervisor telling me that when I removed a child from home to always be sure to have the mother give the child one or two things that are meaningful to the child to take along to the shelter home or to the foster home. And, you know, oftentimes parents were reluctant to part with that because they were giving up the child and they knew the significance of the transitional object but that, that goes to some of the personality things that go on with abusive and neglectful parents perhaps but but usually with some some discussion and in and, and, and encouraging the parent to step into the role of the child in this situation they were willing to to do that but transitional objects can be can be very important and it's that sort of that connection uh with with the home and with the parent and Toddlers, as this says here, also see it as having magical powers powers to soothe and protect. I think Linus is probably, maybe he's not, but he's about the age where he should be letting go of his blanket. But, uh, you know, he's been, what, five or six years of age, seven. I don't know if he's going to school or not for, what, 50, 60 years now. And we talked about attachment styles also, the anxious versus the secure attachment style and and the attachment styles continue to uh, affect developmental trajectories in, in early childhood and these styles are probably established in earlier stages um, and so an anxious an anxiously attached child is going to be more dependent on the parent the mother generally the caregiver and um, those children perform in, lo in longer term studies you know perform more poorly on teaching tasks at three and a half years of age, whereas those that, that come into this period with a secure attachment tend to be higher at four and a half years of age, tend to be higher in curios curiosity, uh, agency, activity, self-esteem, and positive emotions. And they're just better able to regulate their own emotional state. So, so attachment, something always important and, uh, to keep in mind. 
Okay, well that's it for the first uh, the first part of this chapter. Not too, not too long, really. I think I did okay. So uh, tune in to part two here as soon as you get to take a break. Okay.